my name is Simon Kerrigan. I'm a QTVI and uh, an education specialist at RNIB. Uh, I've previously worked as lead QTVI at uh, a large integrated resource for children and young people with vision impairment in a mainstream secondary school. I'm just going to share my presentation while um, Jane introduces herself. Hello everyone, uh, thank you very much for inviting us back this year. So uh, I'm Jane Sharp, I'm a QTVI as well and have worked for a local authority both in a resource base and as a peripatetic QTVI and then I moved to RNIB about 18 months ago and I worked there uh, in the education team uh, with Simon and some of you will know our Head of Education, Kerine Sutherland. So I'll pass back to Simon. Thank you. Um, I'll just start uh, by uh, going through a few of the aims of the session that we're going to go through today. Um, we're going to start hopefully by giving you an update on some of the progress that's been made um, in availability of modified past papers, which I know a lot of people will be keen to hear. Um, we'll also talk about some of the work that we're doing uh, with um, exam boards on the quality of modified papers. Um, then we'll, um, we'll give a bit of an outline of some of the key events that take place uh, to prepare children and young people with vision impairment for 14 plus exams. I know some of the questions related to Scotland, so we will try to um, cover uh, England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland um, in this as well. Uh, we'll do this overview by going through uh, two case studies to illustrate the journey throughout secondary education up to the exams at the end of secondary education. Um, we'll, one of the case studies is a Braille user and another case study is a mo uh, modified large print user. Uh, and we'll highlight, hopefully through these case studies, we'll highlight the teamwork that's involved in preparing those learners, um, but also working with the families, working with the school, the teachers, the exams officers, the teaching assistants at the school, and also the, the, the VI team, so QTBI, specialist teaching assistants, and also the exam boards as well, um, to illustrate uh, best practice for that mm. exams process. Mm. Um, I'm going to start by uh, uh, going through a few uh, updates. So we have seen some significant progress in the availability of modified um, past papers that are available to, to uh, children, young people with vision impairment um, to use as a exam preparation. So to prepare for their, their um, exams at the end of, of secondary school. Um, Exam boards that are under JCQ, so that includes uh, AQA, OCR, Pearson at Excel, CCEA and uh, WJC, have all uh, agreed to produce modified papers that were not produced for original um, live series, for a live series. So up until recently, uh, exam uh, papers, modified exam papers were almost kind of seen as a, a byproduct of the exams process. So if a student with uh, a vision impairment had taken a, a modified large print paper for that particular exam or a braille paper, then that would be made available to use as past papers. But from this year, um, uh, the exam boards have agreed, the exam boards under, J under JCQ have agreed to, um, to produce those um, that were not produced for live series. So that's, that's a really big step forward. Uh, there is a deadline date to, to order those, 31st of October, um, but it will massively in, in enhance the pool of modified past papers available for students to practice with and to prepare for, for the exams using the type of format that they will receive for their real exams. So it's a really uh, big step forward and it's welcome news to us. Um, we're also uh, working with exam boards. We've received some uh, 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 feedback from QTVIs on uh, issues experienced in 2023 exams. So we will uh, address the identified issues by communicating with exam boards directly on the issues that they've found. Uh, so it's just a bit of an update. And I'm gonna start by uh, talking about, I'll, I'll cover a case study um, of a, a modified large print user looking at the process throughout secondary school in the lead up to the exams. And Jane Sharp, my colleague, will talk about um, uh, a, a braille user leading up to, to their exams. So this is a, a fictional case study and it's best practice. It illustrates be best practice. I appreciate that not best practice is not always followed, but it does give you an idea of what would be happening at different points throughout a, a child's secondary education. Um, the case study is Anya. So Anya is a modified large print user. Her preferred format in primary school is um, 22 point Comic Sans, and she had all lesson resources pr produced in uh, 22 point co Comic Sans. That includes uh, electronic resources 
and print work resources as well. So worksheets and things like that printed out. She's a proficient iPad uh, user. So she uses uh, an iPad to stream content from a whiteboard onto the iPad, iPad using a program called Splashtop. Um, she is able to read books on the iPad and access some worksheets, although she does access worksheets on uh, in printed format as well. She uses thick lined um, exercise books, so large print exercise books, and she is learning to touch type in primary school. In her transition to secondary school, Anya um, moves towards using 24 point aerial uh, um, uh, font on A4. The reason why she moves to this is this matches with the most appropriate modified large print format that's available that would be available in exams. It's only a very small change from her preferred format in primary school, but she gradually moves to this with a, uh, internal exams first, and all of the internal exams are produced according to the UCAF, United Kingdom Association for Accessible Format, the best practice guidance. This is guidance on how to produce modified large print and braille papers. Um, and where possible, these papers are downloaded from exam board websites so that Anya gets um, a, a, an exam paper that reflects the format that she's going to get in the real exam or requested from the exam board, as you can do from this year, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, this gives her the, the format that she's going to receive in the exam. Um, we appreciate that a lot of exams, a lot of subject uh, leads will produce exams that are not a full paper. They might produce um, some questions uh, combine questions on a particular topic within that subject. So not every exam that's done as an internal exam in secondary school would be a full exam paper. So yeah, the, if, if, if the school or QTBI is producing a paper, they'll use the UCAF best practice guidance to make it as similar to the exam that that student will receive in the real thing. Um, during review meetings, parents uh, would speak to the, the, uh, the SENCO and the BI team. Um, the type of questions that you could ask or the type of information to be passed on to the, uh, the parents would be the optimum format that's going to be used by Anya, um, how <laughs> education professionals are, are moving towards that and helping to prepare Anya for her exams. OK, so next, this is really looking at the development of normal way of working throughout secondary school from uh, the start, from uh, the first year in secondary school all the way up to the point at which uh, Anya takes her exams. So from year, first year up to the exams, um, Anya's access arrangements would be assessed. This would be assessed through internal exams and also looking at normal way of working in lessons to build up this um, normal way of working that works with how her preferred formats and her preferred ways of working and uh, kind of building that into the, the, the exam's normal way of working. Um, this, the evidence from internal exams would be uh, kept in an exams profile uh, that the SENCO would keep and that profile will be available. It shows the evidence of need so that the fact that um, Anya does need these access arrangements for her exams for internal and external exams but also it shows the history of provision so if, if Anya's um, access arrangements or her format that she uses changes during secondary school it shows when it changed and how it changed and the, the, the evidence that was that led to that change in, in access arrangements or, or um, formats used. Um, through this, it was established that, uh, that Anya needs a, a reader. She did try using uh, a reader in first year in secondary school, but for preferred, you, preferred reading herself. Throughout that first year, she started to, to complain of some visual fatigue and tired eyes. So um, uh, started to use a reader for some longer text when she was getting more uh, visual fatigue. And also at the end of the day, you'll probably um, know that, that uh, students with, with lots of different types of vis uh, uh, vision impairment might experience visual fatigue. And it's, it might just be at the end of an exam. It might be when you're reading very long texts, it might be when you're tired. So she started to build in using a reader when she's reading those very long texts and then gradually work um, with the reader with a uh, to, to develop a more efficient use of a reader in exams. Um, she works with two to three members of staff. So she becomes really familiar with how that, then the, then the reader becomes familiar as well with how to work together as a reader for Anya. So they read in lessons and in all internal and external exams. So student and, and member of staff are then able to um, familiarize themselves with the rules for a reader 
and the JCQ access arrangements and reusable adjustments have rules of what uh, a reader can be asked to do and what they can't be asked to do. So they both become really familiar with that and also with Anya's preferred way of working. So that establishes yeah, what they can and what they can't do. And hopefully by doing this in um, more controlled and more comfortable situations, internal exams and, and during uh, lessons, they build up that kind of comfortable relationship and use the, the reader in an efficient way. So Anya doesn't get to the, the final exams and then isn't sure what she can ask the reader to do and what she can't ask the reader to do. It's already been um, established what she can and what she can't do. Um, they're all also able to um, establish the, the need for 25% uh, extra time and supervised rest breaks. Again, through internal exams, through the, amount, the number of questions completed on internal exams, the amount of time used, um, and the evidence is maintained in that profile in the JCQ file by the, the SENCO. Um, there was a question in advance about supervised rest breaks and whether the supervised rest break would um, be taken as part of the extra time or whether it's in addition to it. It is in addition to the extra time. So, um, but the supervised rest break is a break from the paper. The, the student's not allowed to have the paper during that supervised rest break. Um, it's, a, it's a break from the paper. It's not thinking time for answering the questions. Um, at this stage here, uh, developing this normal way of working, parents could ask uh, the children um, how they feel, how, how they uh, work in exams, whether they have enough time to finish the exams, whether they feel rushed at the end of the exam, mm -hmm. whether they feel bored at the end of the exam, mm -hmm. they've got plenty of time to, to, um, to go through it. Um, just bear in mind that the uh, extra time should be equipped equivalent access to uh, mm -hmm. other students um, so if there's an internal exam where nobody finishes it the, the the child or young person with a vision impairment wouldn't be allowed extra time to go and check through the paper it should be equivalent to the rest of the students taking that exam um, could also ask about any visual fatigue that the, the 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 child is experiencing so any tired eyes whether that's at specific times during the exams whether it's at the end of exams or during um, essay questions um, and then kind of feed this information back to school um, and also how they feel about using a reader or a scribe or a practical assistant, whether they know what they can ask them to do, whether um, they, they feel that they've practiced with that particular member of staff, whether they're familiar with the member of staff, um, whether they're comfortable with that member of staff. So kind of just asking about how the access arrangements are used in school um, uh, just to get become familiar with how the student is working in exams. Um, in the event, so this is during the exams, in the event of a, a timetable clash, so when the timetable comes through, uh, they realise, again, this is a question that was asked in advance, um, that there's a clash between lesson between uh, exams in that timetable. It is possible in certain circumstances to move one of the exams either to later on in that day or to the next day, and that does include Saturdays as well, so you can move an exam from a uh, Friday to a Saturday. Um, also during the exams, unfortunately, uh, Anya has a technical issue with her laptop. It's during an English literature paper. Um, she's built up familiarity with using a particular type of laptop where, she's, where she can touch type really quickly. She knows where all the keys are. She's really familiar with using that particular laptop. On the morning of the exam, that laptop doesn't load up, breaks down. She has to use a different laptop in exams mode. So she's using an unfamiliar uh, laptop, but also this causes a delay to the start of the exam and she's unfamiliar, she's not comfortable with using it. So the role of the teacher and the teaching assistant and, and the uh, exams officer at this point would be to keep Anya calm, to reassure her, maybe make her a drink, talk through the process of uh, special consideration at the end of the exam. So if, if something affects her grade or her uh, ability to, uh, to show her normal um, attainment, then she can apply for uh, um, special consideration. Uh, also talk her through whether there's any knock-on timing um, implications from starting that exam late, just so it helps to um, maintain a composure, to, to help uh, keep that confidence going into the exam. We don't want to kind of knock anybody's confidence. And I know something that goes wrong can really knock, knock, knock a student's confidence. So uh, as part of the exam's preparation, Anya, um, prepared for any potential issues that could arise. So things like this, the, the laptop not working or any, any access technology not working properly. So hopefully that should reassure her and should make her feel a bit more comfortable during the exams. Um, 
the exams officers at the end of the exam would take details of, of the, um, the questions that were affected or how it has affected the exam and then um, would decide whether they're, they're going to apply for special consideration on behalf of the student. Uh, the school could apply for special consideration after the event. Um, role of the parents in this situation is to, again, reassure Anya or, or your child, uh, discuss what happened, speak to school if you want to get clarification on anything, uh, and try again to keep you keep them calm, keep them compo composed and focused for the rest of the exams period. It is a very stressful time. Exams are stressful for everybody, they're stressful for the students, for the parents, for the teachers, for everybody. So trying to keep as, as calm as possible at this time so that she can complete the rest of the exams to, to the best of her ability would help. And I think I'm moving over to uh, Jane now. Thank you, Simon. Yes, I've, I've uh, had my coughing fit out of the way, just sucking a sweet to keep my voice going. <laughs> so thank you. Um, yeah, so as you've seen, um, the preparation for exams is over a long period of time. It's not just in the run up to exams. Um, so we're going to meet Jacob. I feel like I know Jacob quite well after thinking about him for a few days, but he is fictional. So if he appears familiar, uh, he's not. <laughs> Um, so Jacob in primary school um, showed a preference for learning through audio. His access to print was very restricted and certainly not an efficient way to work. So that was established quite early on. Um, he can read grade one Braille. He's not a keen Brailleist though. Now, in terms of equipment, he's very keen on his technology. So he uses a whole range of devices. So uh, for reading books, he prefers to use his daisy player. He's got a voice recorder, quite a simple one that he uses uh, for various tasks. Um, like, for example, when they're when they're doing um, their English work, their literacy work, and they're starting out stories with some structure, like an introduction, a couple of paragraphs of the story and a conclusion, then um, he'll use his, his voice recorder to plan those sections out before he starts writing. And that's just one example. Uh, it's got a Braille note taker. He mainly uses it through the audio, but obviously he's got the Braille there to check and he does like writing in Braille. Uh, can use a Perkins and he's got a pen friend, which again uses for a whole range of tasks. So he brings those uh, pieces of technology with him to his secondary school. Starting secondary school, of course, the first thing to do is nothing to do with exams. It's all about getting settled in, making friends, getting used to the new routines and establishing those working relationships with staff that he's, to start with, unfamiliar with and that are unfamiliar with him. But once that settling in period um, is passed, that is a time then to start thinking about Jacob's normal way of working and how that needs to be tweaked or adapted to the new setting. So not only is he moving between lessons now, the teaching is a bit more formal, the pace of work is faster, the increased demand of the work as well is something to consider. And all these things mean that he just needs to adapt his, his normal ways of working a little bit. And that takes time to find things that, that work for him in his new environment. So uh, once he's settled in and he's got these new ways of working, this will be a time when the team around Jacob, so that is Jacob himself, his family, the school staff, um, the QTVI and any other VI specialist staff that work with him, will start to be thinking about what are the areas of development for Jacob. So we're thinking about his wider development but also with some focus on you know how is he going to access his exams later on and all these thoughts that people are having and informal discussions will be brought to what's usually an annual meeting to review and update his written plan of support so in England that might be an education health and care plan uh, Wales might be an individual uh, development plan and um in Scotland, it might be a child's plan and in Northern Ireland, a statement, or it might just be a more informal kind of written plan. So that's an opportunity for everybody to discuss 
what areas they think that it needs to develop in and then these can inform any objectives and outcomes that are written into that plan. So many of the specialist skills areas that will be identified are essential for effective study and to increase independence, but they will also serve the purpose of aligning Jacob's normal way of working with the available access arrangements for exams. And not only that, they'll also most likely be in line with best practice as set out in the curriculum framework for children and young people with vision impairment, which uh, some of you might be starting to get familiar with and some people might not have been introduced to yet. So if we think of an example, so area three in the framework, that uh, includes Braille literacy. So learning grade two Braille uh, will allow Jacob to access a wider range of reading material generally, because there's much more available in grade two than there is in grade one. It'll also allow him to access the Braille papers offered as standard by exam boards. Area three, also covers learning the specialist braille codes for maths and science and that will allow Jacob to read technical content which even if you have a reader in an exam it is very useful to be able to look at that detail of an equation like a chemical equation or a mathematical expression yourself. Of course specialist uh, skills development takes place over the long term and there needs to be plenty of practice and reinforcement both in lessons in school and when doing homework. So everybody in the team around Jacob has got a role in supporting his development there, which will also help to prepare him to access his exams better later on. So during the first couple of years at secondary school, evidence will be being collected about his normal way of working in assessment. So there's normal way of working in class, a normal way of working in an assessment, so like a class test or a topic test or something, and they don't have to be the same. So when you hear the phrase normal way of working, when we're talking about exams, we mean the normal way of working in an assessment. So things like when does he use a human reader? When when does that work best for him? When does he use when does he want to use hard copy papers? When does he prefer electronic papers? You know, what situations, what subjects, what type of questions? We saw earlier that he uses a whole range of equipment, but what equipment is best for which type of question or which type of task? So all of this kind of thing um, will develop over time. He'll decide what works best uh, for what and evidence will be noted. Another important thing to collect evidence about is what kind of additional time does he need for, for assessment? So in the first couple of years, you're starting to get an idea about this and just making some notes. Over this time, uh, Jacob will also be learning with the adults that support him, um, you know, how they can work in exams. So it might not be in the first couple of years, it might not be strictly along the rules of a reader, scribe and practical assistant, but kind of working towards that. An important thing to do, even during these early times, is to build Jacob's confidence and resilience for assessments. Uh, so plenty of opportunities to sit these little tests and little assessments. Um, and it's a good opportunity to get used to things like having to go to a different room. Um, often when there are assessments on particularly end of year assessments, there's a lot of pressure on all the officers and tiny little rooms for all the students that have readers and Jacob won't always be able to go in the same room. So it's a good opportunity to get used to that. The bell's going to be going partway through the tests, you know, things like that to just get used to. He'll have different adults working with him as reader, scribe, practical assistant. Um, and again, that's something to start getting used to. And uh, somebody who's worked with a lot of students with technology, there will be the odd issue with technology. There's nothing you can do about it, but really, it's not very nice at the time, but it's a great opportunity to build that resilience. So during this time, it's really important, particularly like end of year tests when there's a lot of exams together, that communication between home and school is really important because Jacob presents as coping well in school, but, you know, um, it might be presenting quite differently at home, might be quite stressed or whatever. 
So at the end of one year of exams, Jacob's seen finding school, but his parents let the QTVI and the form teacher know that actually he was really worried about the lessons he was missing to have his additional time, uh, which he needed for maths and science papers. But because that information was shared early on, the QTVI and school were able to work with Jacob to identify lessons he didn't mind coming out of so much and um, then finishes his tests in those. So things can be nipped in the bud if that um, communication is good. So the other thing about the early years in secondary is it's a great opportunity to try out all the subjects that the school's got to offer. Uh, so th during this time, Jacob will be making some decisions about which ones he likes best, which ones he can't wait to drop uh, ready for when he comes up to options time. So Simon, I don't know if you can put the next slide on. Thank you very much. So options time is decision time and families and the student themselves play the major part uh, in this role. So school will follow the family's lead on this. So Jacob's school provide everybody with an options booklet. Jacob gets it in electronic format, which has been reformatted by uh, the staff that support him. And Jacob's family, along with Jacob, attend the option evening and speak to the subject teachers. But as well as speaking to the subject teachers, Jacob and his parents talk to his QTVI um, about personalising his timetable so that he can continue to have one-to-one -one specialist skills teaching from the VI specialist staff. And that's important um, that that continues throughout his education. So Jacob likes art and he likes DT and he's not sure uh, which one he's going to pick out of the two. But there is some uncertainty over how accessible these subjects are because of the visual and practical elements. So what happens here is that the QTVI, once they realise after speaking to their family and to Jacob that these, um, they're a bit concerned about accessibility around these subjects, the QTVI arranges to meet with the DT teacher, with the art teacher, so that they can go through the course specification, that's the um, details of exactly what is taught, identify the assessment objectives in there, so they're all the things that students get marks for, and look at each one individually and see how these can be adapted for Jacob. So it does take a bit of time, um, but both teachers are really keen to include Jacob in their lessons and encourage him because he's shown promise uh, in the first couple of years at secondary school. Jacob's got a great attitude, so they like working with him. He's very creative and enthusiastic. So once the teachers have got the idea about making the adaptations, the subject teachers uh, come up with lots of ideas of how they can adapt um, the tasks within the specification uh, to allow Jacob to, to do that. And also within the uh, rules for access arrangements for exams. There's a little bit of uncertainty about whether he'd be able to access the top marks for some aspects of the DT specification. So, what happens then is that the QTVI and the DT teacher have a meeting with Jacob and the family, explain the situation so that then they, they can go away and make an informed choice about uh, what option to choose. So in the end, Jacob chooses art because he feels that that gives him more opportunity to play to his strengths because um, he gets more choice to decide the methods that he uses to develop his assessed pieces in that so uh, that is what goes on around options. I suppose the other thing to think about um, at options time is to consider workload. Um, our Brailleist, like Jacob, takes longer to do everything because access to information isn't as immediate. And uh, so that that is considered in the number of GCSEs chosen or national fives. And um, in Jacob's case, it was decided that uh, choosing one fewer would give him opportunities within the week to manage his workload, to do any pre-teaching, post-teaching, catch-up work, 
um, and also give him uh, some space in his timetable to do his specialist skills. So next slide, please, Simon. So we're getting close now to the run-up to exams. Uh, so we're actually taking the option subjects now. So Jacobs makes, makes a start on the actual courses he's going to be examined on. And in the end of topic tests, um, this is a great opportunity to work out or refine his uh, preferred ways to access uh, these tests. So he's now got a Windows computer with a screen reader. So he's got even more options of ways to work. So the ways that he chooses for each subject and each type of uh, paper needs to be recorded and that evidence uh, collected. Uh, as I mentioned before, you need to have evidence of how much additional time is needed. So for Jacob, uh, it doesn't need any extra in history and RE because uh, the questions are quite short and it's mainly him writing. Uh, it works out that 50% works quite well for him in English, but in science and maths, where there are all the diagrams to interpret, uh, that is 100%. So it doesn't have to be the same for each subject. Over this time as well, Jacob is becoming much more familiar with how best to use adult support within the exams. So um, when it helps him to use a reader or a scribe or a practical assistant, and when it helps him to be more independent. And the adults that are working with him have had the training for those roles. They're aware of what they can do and what they can't do. And it isn't Jacob doesn't need to learn what they can do and can't do, uh, but it helps if he's got some idea and then they can say to him, or, oh, you know, I can do that for you, or I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do that for you. So that's their role to know what they can do and what they can't do. Obviously, uh, as we get towards the exams closer and closer, it's going to be a time for revision. So for the whole class, uh, some subject teachers just give out a ton of revision resources and links to online resources. Um, but this isn't really appropriate for Jacob. It would take him all his time just to sort through the resources, never mind find what's useful. So um, the QTVI and subject teachers for the different subjects get together. They speak with Jacob and between them, they decide how they can target the areas that Jacob is best for Jacob to focus his revision on. And then once these individual areas within subjects have been decided, then appropriate resources are found for that area, which are then reformatted by the people that support Jacob in school and then give them to him. So that takes away the very time consuming task of Jacob sorting through a generic revision resource to find something. Uh, for him so he can just get down to the revision straight away and it will be the revision that will help him most rather than uh, wasting time revising things that he's actually very good at already. Of course a lot of revision, most revision takes place at home uh, alongside homework so clearly families have an important role here both monitoring revision and homework and monitoring the workload and feedback um, to the school and QTVI, whether that's going well, whether Jacob's got lots of free time and could be doing a bit more work, or whether it is actually quite stressed and overloaded. And that constant uh, communication and feedback is really helpful. The other thing that uh, adults in school will be doing with Jacob is uh, preparing him for the exams by building his confidence up and resilience. And when he's doing assessments in school, things go wrong sometimes, particularly because he likes his, his technology and he's making good use of it. So each of those things individually is probably a bit um, uh, discombobulating at the time, but each little error or problem is a great opportunity within a class test situation uh, for Jacob to develop some resilience and think, okay, if that happens again, what's the backup strategy? or on the day, okay, this has happened, what do we do about it now? So over time, it builds up that confidence. Adults talk to him uh, before exams, okay, we're gonna do this. We've got a backup 
let's say voice recorder, for example, if your battery runs out on that one um, and that type of thing, uh, if there are problems with the paper, what are we going to do about this? So they can talk through sort of what if strategies. So Jacob starts to build his confidence up that the adults supporting him exams um, will be able to help him in the real exam. If there was a problem, it wouldn't be a crisis. It'd be something that the adults would be able to sort out. So whilst it might put him off a little bit, um, you know, it is it, not sort of uh, catastrophizing it. OK, so then we get to exam time and Jacob's exams luckily go pretty well. Uh, I don't know, Simon, if we move on to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, Jacob's in for longer than other students because he has the additional time. Um, so the staff in the resource base in the school that he is in try and just make it a bit nicer for him, a bit more relaxing uh, when he's on supervised rest breaks or lunch breaks between exams and he can't mix with other students because maybe his paper's been put to the afternoon. Um, they'll give him hot chocolate and biscuits, things like that. Have a walk around the block, let him listen to music and stuff just to try and keep it okay for him with him spending extra time in school. So unfortunately on one of the science papers, uh, partway through the exam, he asks his reader if there's an error in a chemical equation. So she notices that on the paper, some dots have been flattened and tells him to just move on to the next question because he obviously can't read that equation for himself. So after the exam, the school uh, asked the QTVI and the adult who was supporting in that exam to write a statement about what happened and what the impact was on Jacob. Obviously, he wasn't able to answer that question. And then school submit an application for special consideration for that. When Jacob goes home, though, he told his parents there'd been a mistake on the paper and he was, he was worried that he had lost some marks. Um, parents were aware that exam, you know, things can go wrong and that schools can let exams know, exam boards know about problems. So they reassured him. And then the next day, once he'd gone to school, they contacted school and just asked for confirmation that uh, some action had been taken. And school were able to explain uh, that they'd applied for special consideration. Uh, in the history exam, there was another issue. Uh, one question presented some information in a table and the screen reader read it out in an order that, that was just confusing. So Jacob asked his reader to read the table instead. When they talked about it uh, at the end of the exam, Jacob said it didn't actually affect his ability to answer the question. It hadn't upset him or anything like that or made him anxious because they practiced for this kind of thing in advance. It, you know, it wasn't the first time that screen reader had read something slightly oddly. So in this situation, uh, special consideration wasn't applied for. So um, I think that's really important there that, um, you know, it's uh, special consideration is applied for when the student is disadvantaged. And you don't need to apply for it where, where the student isn't uh, seriously disadvantaged. And it's also important that communication between home and school. So even if the student is presenting one way at school, it's going, no, 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 that's fine. If something different's being said at home where it's a bit more relaxed, then, uh, you know, to let school know about that. Because as Simon said, they can apply for special consideration after the fact. It doesn't have to be on the day. So that's Jacob's story. Uh, about exams. So I'm going to pass back to Simon, who is um, going to address some of the questions that came in. Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah, there were a few questions about um, the modified formats that are available for um, 14 plus exams. So I'm going to try and cover um, modified formats that are available in England, Wales, Northern Ireland first, and then I'll go through the, um, the modified formats that are available in Scotland through the SQA. Um, in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, GCSEs and A-levels, 14 plus exams are available in uh, um, a range of formats. So uh, A3 enlarged, this is the standard, this is an un unmodified, A3 unmodified enlarged paper. Um, this is a standard paper that's enlarged from A4 paper onto A3, giving roughly 14 point. But just bear in mind, that's an unmodified paper, so there are no um, changes to the details on the paper, uh, to the uh, images and things like that on the, the paper. It's just the same as the standard paper enlarged to A3. 
Um, there's also modified enlarged or modified large print papers that are available. These papers have um, the layout simplified, so um, uh, any visual complexity is removed, uh, but to maintain the same level of difficulty of that, uh, that exam paper. So things like the pictures will be made more accessible, um, bold lines on the, the images, removing any visual clutter. Um, uh, adding picture descriptors in things like uh, history exams or English exams. So if there's a detailed image, there'll be a, um, a factual description written for that particular image to give the, the visual information that's available to, to candidates in, in, the, in the image. Uh, any charts or graphs are modified, so the more the um, uh, access to them, visual access is easier to those. Um, but again, it, it maintains the same level of difficulty of the paper but in, increases the, um, the uh, visual access to that paper. These modified large print papers are available for um, uh, GCSE A-level exams in 18 point, 24 point and 36 point. They're aerial bold. Uh, the 18 point is available on A4 paper. The 36 point is available on A3 paper and 24 point is available on both A4 and A3 paper. Um, also, uh, grade two Braille is available as default uh, that the exams officer can just apply for, uh, apply for directly. Uh, schools can request that grade one Braille, so uncontracted Braille is also produced, so you can have either grade one or grade two. Um, they're available with tactile diagrams with Braille labels on them. Uh, large print papers are also available with uh, tactile diagrams with print labels. So you can have the, the tactile diagrams, print labels alongside a, a modified large print paper. Um, schools can also order, order non-interactive PDF papers. So non-interactive, they're called non-interactive PDFs because they're not right on papers. You can't write your answers directly on those papers. Um, they can access, a student can access those with a screen reader. Obviously, the student should practice using the screen reader that they're familiar with, whether that's um, JAWS or NVDA. Um, Pearson uh, edXL do uh, um, offer interactive P uh, PDF papers, so ones that you can actually write on. Um, the papers that are available uh, in Scotland, so um, it's a slightly wider range of uh, modified large print um, formats. So 14 point, 18 point, 24 point, 36 point and 48 point. And they're available in either um, portrait or landscape orientation. Um, SQA also offer question papers on um, a range of colors that are written there. So there's cream, pink, yellow, green, blue, purple, and orange. Um, for the, uh, the exams in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, if you wanted the, the paper on a different color, um, different colored paper, then the school would need to order the either modified large print or standard paper. And then um, using early opening, you can open the paper early, you apply for it, and then you can photocopy that or print it onto um, a different colored paper. Also, we did have some questions about, let's just move on to my next slide. We did have some questions about access arrangements that are available for um, 14 plus exams. Um, uh, the access arrangements uh, that are frequently used for uh, by children and young people with vision impairment. Um, uh, obviously, these need to be the, the student's normal way of working. Um, it needs to, you need to be able to show, or the, the um, uh, SENCO needs to be able to show and keep evidence that uh, the, the candidate would be at a persistent and dis a significant disadvantage. And also the QTVI would need to give supporting evidence for these access arrangements to be in place. Um, I did talk about supervised rest breaks when I, I covered Anya's uh, case study. So supervised rest breaks, um, the, uh, the, like I said earlier on, the quest, there was a question about whether they would be part of the extra time. They would be in addition to the extra time. Um, uh, the uh, invigilator could pause the time, the, the, the clock, and then restart once they've finished that supervised rest breaks, but no access to the paper during, or the answer paper, the question or answer paper during supervised rest breaks. It is a break from the paper, it's not reading time, they can't have an access, any access to it. Um, also, uh, students can have a, um, a word processor, as in the case of Anya, that uh, also applies to a Perkins Braille or um, a Braille Note, Braille Note Touch. Um, on these electronic devices, they can't have access to the internet or any files or email or any stored memory. Um, the student can is able to type the extended writing. So if there are essay questions, they can type and use touch typing for those questions and handwrite the shorter questions. And the, um, the invigilator at the end would then uh, kind of organize that so that 
all the documents go off to the exam board. Um, extra time. Uh, so uh, uh, schools and colleges, centres can apply for extra time, um, uh, normally ranging from 25% up to 100%, but it can be above 100% extra time. But then you've got to really think about um, the amount of extra time that's used and whether that could possibly become um, the, with very, very long exams running into other exams and also um, the visual fatigue that you'd experience from having very long exams, whether that's the right situation for, for that particular student or whether you should have um, other access arrangements that would help. Um, a computer or human reader. So uh, um, in terms of a computer reader, it could be a, a screen reader like JAWS or NVDA, but as I said before, practice that, practice using that particular screen reader with the PDF papers. And you can download, the QTVI can download the, um, the, the past papers from the exam board web pages uh, to try um, the screen readers with them and get familiar with using a screen reader with those particular type of paper. Um, it's really important with any type of access arrangement that you're familiar with how to use that access arrangement. Scribe and speech to, to uh, speech to text uh, software. Um, so uh, there are notes for a scribe and notes for a reader, which uh, it's it's useful for a, a student to familiarise themselves with and to work with the reader or scribe um, to to obviously to familiarise yourself with 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 what they can do and what they can't do during during those exams. Um, the practical assistant. Uh, so this is a very specific thing to the type of task that the practical assistant will be helping with. So there's not the detailed um, notes for a scribe or notes for a, a reader. There's not the same type of document available for a practical assistant in JCQ uh, access arrangements and reasonable adjustments. Um, the practical assistant can't complete any uh, physical tasks that form part of the assessment objectives for that particular exam. Uh, they, they've got to work under the student's guidance. So things like uh, if a student's completing a graph in, in an exam, the student could um, uh, uh, indicate the point at which uh, a point goes onto a graph and the practical assistant can mark that point on the, on the graph. Things like that using um, uh, 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 tactile rulers, giving the correct equipment. So it needs to be guided by the student in those cases. And I think I'm passing back to Jane. Thank you. Okay, so we got a question in about um, sourcing um, resources um, for exams. So uh, the responsibility is really on the school and the local authority working together to provide curriculum materials in accessible format. So this would include set texts um, for exams, textbooks and revision guides. Um, the QTVI is the best person to sort of lead on this. Uh, I'm going to go through some different types of resources separately because I think the situation is slightly different for some of them. So te set text, these you would want the uh, the text exactly as it is in the print copy but in the accessible version and there are various online libraries uh, where you can get these and accessible book providers. So call Scotland Books for All um, is a place to go, RNB Bookshare Customise uh, from Guide, a service from Guide Dogs will provide large print hard copy and bespoke formats. RNIB's Talking Book Library, if you want it in audio. RNIB's Large Print Transcription Service. RNIB's Braille Library, if you want it in hard copy Braille. If you want electronic versions, uh, you've got other uh, avenues as well. Project Gutenberg, if it's a classic text, which some of the English set texts are. Or you can just go mainstream with uh, Audible and any of the ebook sellers, um, you know, like Kindle or uh, Apple Books or something like that. So the various places where where set texts can be um, obtained from textbooks um, for a Brailleist, particularly, um, it's usually best to modify these. Uh, in-house, uh, particularly if the teacher's only going to be using certain elements of a book, which, which tends to be the situation. So a teacher might just be using end of topic questions or they might just be using summary, um, uh, you know, summaries from topics or something like that. So 
really school modifying um, the entire textbook is uh, one not good use of their resources, but equally it gives a lot for the for the student to read through when they only need a certain aspect. So the QTVI will be able to work with subject teachers to see which bit of the textbook is going to be used, and then. Um, give advice on how that should be modified and produced. Uh, some are available in accessible formats, uh, particularly if your student uses electronic and get the whole book. Uh, revision guides, accessibility does, um, does vary. So if you're wanting um, electronic versions of revision guides, they're relatively easily accessible, even if not um, initially approaching publishers will um will often give vi services access to electronic versions if you want in braille um rnib bookshare has some uh, in what are called quick and dirty braille i.e automatic translations um and some that have been professionally transcribed so the number that have been professionally transcribed is growing over time because that's part of uh, rnib's offer um uh, Customise will provide large print hard copies of uh, revision guides if they've got sufficient notice. But a bit like the textbooks and a bit like we talked about with Jacob, it's quite often better for Brailleists particularly to provide them with targeted revision resources rather than just a Braille copy of a, a whole revision guide. So the bits that are going to uh, be best for them. Um, so the next question that... Um, I'm going to look at, uh, we'll ask what's been done to support consistency in the approach to exams across the UK. So a great question. There is a lot happening. Um, the focus really is on training. So I'm just going to go through some of the training that people can access. So every year RNIB runs exam update training and uh, anybody's welcome to attend that, but it's aimed at VI education professionals. Uh, something similar happens in Scotland, SQA and the Scottish Sensory Centre come together to provide exam training around the SQA qualifications. Each exam board uh, each year runs training for its exams officers, so that's the exams officers working in schools, and then the exams officers will provide in-house training for their staff who are acting as invigilators, readers, scribes, etc., We've got the event today where parents can come along and families and find out about exams. Because a lot of this is um, training, so consistency uh, will be facilitated through improved training. RNIB are aware that a lot of VI services are under pressure and that they need the capacity to be able to attend training. So our annual Freedom of Information reports call for increased resource and capacity for VI services. And then the follow on from that specific to what we're talking about today is more of them will be able to access exams training. So there's something called the Access Consultation Forum, which uh, Simon attends for RNIB. This is a regular meeting between exam board representatives and Ofqual, where they share information on access to exams and they collaborate on work to continually improve access Similar meetings are held by JCQ and the exam boards who follow their guidance and regulations. Uh, staff who are preparing resources for students in school to get them ready for exams can access some training from VIEW, which is called Prepare for Success. Uh, and this uh, takes them through the best practice guidance for modifying and producing um, assessment materials. And uh, for any inconsistency or uh, any training that's needed on very individual queries, RNIB's education team, that's myself and Simon and Karine, um, offer individual support for that. And we'll be giving you the email address uh, next. It's, if you want to move the um, slide on, Simon, people can see that while I pass over to John, uh, who we gave two questions to. Thank you, Jane. You caught me while I was trying to catch up with the chat as I well. Thought, I thought I'd try and catch it. I was... Oh, Jane's disappeared. So she's obviously sat on her microphone. Um, thank you. I, I hope that the questions sort of uh, that we've been trying to answer in the chat have helped, as we said at the outset. Um, 
some of the questions are very specific and we'll go to um, those that know better than us, I think. So, for example, that questions like Project Gutenberg, um, things like individuals not being able to write on the very dark lines, can they be removed from certain papers and things? And perhaps Pearson colleagues, but certainly we can take it away and look at that through VIEW, LOOK and RNIB operating together. Uh, just, uh, I was asked at the start to just do a summary of Simon and Jane's um, presentations. And I, I hope that people found that the, the case studies helpful. And I think having the balance between a modified large print user and, and a Braille user was very helpful uh, for people in attendance this evening. Um, certainly, it's quite exciting to hear from RNIB that the, the updates on exam provisions, certainly around this increased availability of papers, that it's not just, in a sense, the old papers that are going to be made available. And I would urge those of you who are within um, local authorities and countries where support is available from VI services, you go back to your services and say, we can do this now, and we can get papers that will be very relevant to the young people, to our young people, or my young people, in your case. The issues around quality is, for those of us who's hung around for years, has always been a concern. Um, I did pick up in one of the questions about, you know, just errors and, and yes, proofreading um, is a really onerous task, even for really, really diligent, able Braillists as well, when not only are you looking at what is contained within the paper, but you're having to apply that to learning and question styles and, and thinking about how students will produce their responses to those as well. But again, we, we will take it back, and I'm sure Pearson colleagues are, have been making notes furiously around that quality. But what it does overall, I think, is just that, that message that Jane gave, which is it gives that build-up of opportunities for children and young people to develop their assessment skills as well. So they're not suddenly presented with papers and things on the day or the Saturday, as uh, Simon took us by surprise, I think, and said, uh, that um, and they've got to, as well as undertake the exam or the assessment, they've also got to find their way around something that's perhaps unfamiliar as well. I did say to with Jane from Look, uh, that I would just get a couple of updates on what we're doing with VIEW and NATSIP. So those of you who um, are in the know will know that the DFE are looking at sort of standards around support for disabled learners across uh, the piece. And whilst they're using the phrase minimum standards, we're working hard to make sure that those minimum standards are at a high enough level to ensure that students are getting as much as possible what they need. And picking up Jane's point there about um, developing understanding and developing awareness, certainly that understanding, we're looking at making sure that settings and local authorities and local authority services have the support to ensure that they can meet individual needs. And we're moving away from awareness training and looking much more at systems and system development. Because, for example, I was talking to 120 PGCE students at a university recently and pointed out, you know, that some of them will never see a vision impaired student in their career uh, because it's a low incidence, high need uh, disability. But what they need is to know where to go for support and where to go for help as well. So the additional training that we're putting together with RNIB and colleagues across the different agencies is to increase the awareness of where to go and get support rather than this is what you do if somebody's got cataracts or this is what you do if somebody's got uh, other types of vision impairment as well. So we're hoping that raises the, the quality across the whole sector. Um, it would be remiss of me if I didn't pick up um, Jane's point there as well, which is local authorities are under an awful lot of pressure. There's a huge increase in number of students. There is a move to mainstream. Many local authorities don't even have specialist resource bases now for vision impairment. So the vast majority of students are educated in mainstream where they can be the only student with a vision impairment in their setting. So again, it's that low incidence, high need 
element. And one of the things that we need to get across is that individuality of approach. Um, so things like around exams and around raising awareness and understanding that you can't just apply a template. You need to be working with local authority services, with voluntary sector, with families themselves to say, what is the impact of the vision impairment on my young person, this young person, and how do we build a network of support around that person using all the different agencies and resources that are available. Um, and they are under huge financial pressure, local authorities at the moment. And um, I would ask you to bear with them three takeaways jane would that be okay yeah um we do have the um mentors to go john so i don't know yep. if you want to do three takeaways at the end or three takeaways yep, i'm happy to do that yeah i was yeah. just i was conscious of time and people keep messaging so i'll, I'll go back to the messages and let's yeah, you go have back the mentors to and i'll hold my takeaways till the end thank you yeah Great to hear from you, and yeah, I would I would like you all now to listen to our um, real experiences. So um, I'm so grateful to Abby and her mum Alison um, to come to talk to us. Um, you can introduce yourself. I think um, you're a remarkable young adult, but it hasn't been easy. But before we begin, I want to say to people, this is their experience. I'm sure they'll own. It. It's not going to be like this for all of you but also you know every bad experience people that every young person I know does get through it and it's often the parents beside them that makes a difference as well so over to you two. Hi um so I'll start I'm here with my mum um I'm Abby I have oculocutaneous albinism and nystagmus um and an undiagnosed condition which I call the flashiness um and I'm a large print user. I'm currently studying engineering at university and I'm doing my placement year. Um, so I'm going to talk about a bit about the things that went wrong, but I just want to emphasize that it felt a bit like everything that could go wrong did go wrong with us. And hopefully the chances of that happening again to anyone else are low. Um, and also we hope that in being here today, um, and people hearing what went on, we can help prevent these things happening again. Um, so I'll take you through some of the specific examples of things that went wrong. Um, so the biggest first issue was that the school submitted my access requirements without checking with me first. Um, so they put in the requirements for the wrong size and the wrong format of paper, which meant that obviously when the exam day came, I couldn't see my papers. Um, I wasn't allowed to, so because of the flashiness condition that I have and my nice tagmas, I needed colored paper to be cycled through because once my eyes got used to something, I couldn't read it anymore. And the school weren't happy about me rotating the colors so I was denied that. Um, and I also just want to um, get the message across as well that the there are, you can choose obviously what font that you want your paper in, but there's a lot of people out there like me who my font size was size 32 and the choices for papers was size 24 or size 36. So we're kind of already compromising before we get into the exam even um on things like that and then obviously the fact that the school didn't put in what we asked for requirement wise made that really difficult for me there was a few barriers that were in the way that I think would be quite easy to avoid in future if a few of the rules for example the JCQ rules are changed um we had a fair few debates over what the reader was allowed to say because the JCQ guidance at the time was very open um, and very vague. So for example, it said something about um, not, being allowed, not being allowed to read math symbols. Um, and my school interpreted that as even things like decimal points weren't allowed to be read out loud to me, which obviously 
as a student in a mainstream school doing a mainstream exam and also doing further maths at the time which was equivalent to an AS level um, whilst I was doing my GCSEs you would hope that most students would know what a decimal point is um, and it definitely is not giving us an unfair advantage by reading that out however um, this was how my school interpreted it um, and then the rest breaks as well um, that was another thing that seemed to be quite open to schools to interpret um, my school interpreted it as I wasn't allowed any rest breaks within my extra time so I was allocated 50% extra time so that meant I'd often end up with like an hour or so where I wasn't allowed a single rest break now for me because of my eyes I need regular rest breaks um, like spaced out evenly throughout the exam so that I don't end up with dead eyes at the end of it and no rest breaks. Um, so we did get this in the end. We talked to the school and discussed what would be best for me. Um, and it did take a lot of debating, but I'll let mum go into a bit more of that later. Um, the support staff who were in the exams with me after we spent a lot of time going through every like nitty gritty bit of the rules, hadn't been briefed properly. And unfortunately, a lot of my exams I went into and was told by the support staff that everything we'd agreed was wrong. <laughs> and um, they, even little things that had been agreed right from the start, like I was allowed 50% extra time, they were telling me that I was only allowed 25% and then they had to go off and check this with someone else who had to check it with someone else. And I think most of my exams started at least half an hour late um, because of this. Um, and then because of all the issues with it being in the wrong font size, the school tried to adapt things for me and this, because it was all last minute and quite rushed, led to me having some exams upside down, some back to front, some that were came in puzzle format and you had to re, <laughs> re put them in the right order. Um, I also got given the wrong exam twice, which was quite stressful. Luckily, I noticed it was the wrong exam um, before I started working my way through it. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of things that went wrong 11 out of 23 of my exams for GCSEs um, had something wrong with them um, so things that I want to emphasize from this um, and the, yeah I'll let my mum go into a bit more about what we did to deal with these and how we tried to overcome them and avoid them for the next time um, but I think there's a lot of barriers in place and there's a big misconception that by giving us access to things like readers who are allowed to read things like decimal points, for example, are giving us an advantage. And I think it's really important that um, people see that there's been a, so many disadvantages. For example, there's lots of things in class that we won't be able to see. And no matter what we put in place, there's always going to be content that we will find harder to access, um, which before we even take the exam disadvantages us. Um, also things like calculators and maps and geography for me at least um, I find maps and geography really hard to read and I always know that no matter what we do to them they're always going to be a weak point that I'm going to struggle with seeing calculators um, I found it really hard to find a calculator that did everything that I needed it to do and was big enough for me to see because a lot of the VI adapted ones were aimed at very basic maths and didn't meet the standards needed for GCSE and further maths. Um, so things like that where already we're having to learn different ways around of doing things. Um, and that would be a point of advice actually to other students is to think about when you get into the exam, those things like for me, it was certain maths questions and the maps and geography sometimes if they're only worth two or three marks it's not worth spending time and effort and energy from your eyes on it and just to go straight on to the questions that you know you can answer and you can put all of your effort into it so you don't lose time on that um trying to get class material as accessible as possible before the exam um and the revision material it sounds like that's underway already which is great to hear um 
but yeah just making sure that past exam papers and that sort of thing are accessible to us because again if everyone else has had the option to practice all their papers before the exam that's another area where we would be disadvantaged before we go into the exam um so again just this thing about the idea that we're being advantaged by being given practical assistance and readers and adaptations if anything it's barely leveling the playing field um so yeah um and then what else do i have um also to be aware that although the jcq guidelines are there um the schools can find wraparounds unfortunately and holes in that guidelines um so just because the guideline says everything is perfect and everything can be adapted for us in practice that doesn't always happen and um, to be prepared for that and also for exam boards to be aware of that um, that not everything that you think is happening is actually in play um, so my advice to other students um, and parents to pass on to students more so I guess um, the most important thing I think is for students to keep their head down and keep focused on the exams. Sometimes people around like the school staff um, see this as an opportunity for the students to learn to self-advocate and to be independent and put all of their access needs in place. Um, but it's not the time. Students should be focusing on revision and not on fighting for everything that they need access wise. So. Um, that's part of the reason I brought my mum here because she did a lot of fighting for me behind the scenes um, and that took a massive load off my plate and meant I was able to focus and whenever the schools came back saying we need to hear this from Abby mum came in and was like no you're hearing this from me she's revising um, so definitely focus on that students should be revising and if the parents are able to self -adv uh, to advocate for the children that makes everything a lot easier for us. And things can get really tense as well in the background. So again, keeping that away from the student is really important. Um, so for students to let the parents help and relay everything to the parents, um, document everything for the parents. Um, when the students come in and say, this went wrong at school, I couldn't see this exam, Mrs. So-and-so said I wasn't allowed this, write all that down and document it so that you've got that to hand um, because from experience, the students will forget very quickly. <laughs> um, and then for students, um, a checklist at the start of the exams, just a mental one. Things like if you've got a modified large print paper, always make sure the person in the room also has a normal standard size paper. So if there's anything wrong in the paper, you can cross reference it. Um, also to have a really quick discussion before the time starts for the exam to make sure that the invigilator and the reader prompter practical assistant in the room knows the rules um, so that you don't get halfway through the exam and they say, oh, you're not allowed this. And to when, you, when the time starts on the exam, check the paper through at the start really quickly, the whole thing. So if there's any issues with things that have been printed wrong or things you can't see, then they will stop the clock and take it out of the room and hopefully sort it all out for you. Um, Talk to the teachers as well um, in lessons. If you're worried about how you're going to see a calculator, talk to the maths teachers and get the maths teachers to help you look for one. My maths teacher was delighted that he was teaching me the way of maths from 30 years ago, which no other student had to learn. But he was so excited to share that with me. <laughs> and bring lots of snacks for the exams because they're going to be long and they're going to be tough and you don't want to be hungry, so bring as many snacks as you can. And mum's going to talk in a minute, but contact us if you've got any questions. We are more than happy to help. Um, if it's something as simple as what calculator I use or some more advice on things generally, we want to help make it easier for everyone else um, in any way we can so that they don't go through what we did. And I'm going to pass over to mum, who, as I say, did a lot of the background work and helped a lot. Okay. Thanks. So, um, as Abigail said, my name's Alison. Um, so, um, Abigail's given you, obviously, a summary of what was quite a challenging time for ourselves. Um, I will say that I think she's at the extreme end of the spectrum. And it sounds like from the last few presentations, a lot of things have moved forward. 
I will say that this was five years ago now that Abigail did her GCSE. She didn't do her A-levels, so although we did a lot of work for preparation. Well, I did, it was COVID times. It was COVID times, yeah, so she they didn't exit exam. Um, we did also have an absolutely fantastic QVTI. I couldn't have survived without her and her support. Um, and I think Abigail would feel the same. Um, and I would say, you know, really stress to you, bring in your QTBI, bring them into the access arrangements. If your school is wanting your child to advocate, know when it's appropriate that they can advocate for themselves and know when actually they can say that, but actually they need a bit of adult support next to them, be that their house tutor or the QTBI. And that's, again, we had to step in a couple of times and say, Abigail's happy to speak, but you need to have this person there. Um, obviously we had quite tricky situations. Um, so Abigail's three main problems were obviously the exam papers were wrongly applied for in the first place. Um, following that, we did actually get school to apply for the correct exam papers just before Easter. However, the wrong ones did arrive. Um, we had multiple problems during the exams. Um, as she said, 11 major problems and needing special consideration. And then I'm also just going to talk a little bit about what we subsequently did to have tried to prevent those problems happening again for her A-levels. Um, so first of all, um, what to do, start early, start as early as possible, but equally don't panic if you're not years in advance. Um, read the own, your own school policy. So for us, the first stumbling block was the rest breaks. I didn't realise there was a school policy on it until I got presented with it in Abigail's access arrangements. Um, there's a few documents that I think are invaluable um, and really try and get to know them, really quite familiarise yourself back inside out and back to front. So the first one is the JCQ guidance that's already been mentioned, the access arrangements and reasonable adjustments. Um, they are really, really good. There's, um, they highlight in yellow the updates um, and it's really important for you to know those updates um, sort of year on year because although schools should be aware of them, they're not always. So for instance, Abigail mentioned the problem with the math symbols and who was allowed to read what. When we did our GCSEs, that was very unclear. However, when we then the following year came to do, uh, think about her A-level access arrangements, that um, specific point had been really made much clearer. So, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think that there'll be that much change in perhaps six months, but there is. Um, the other thing to be aware of is something called ICE, Instructions for Conducting Examinations, which is the second JCQ guidance. Now that is a general guidance and you might think all oh, that might not be specific because it applies to everyone, but there's parts in that that we found really useful. In particular, um, you can have early or late opening with exams. So one of the issues we had with Abigail was compressed exams and between some of the exams, she only had 45 minutes between the morning and afternoon exam. Now for a child with a BI um, impairment, um, that means that they get very visually fatigued and that was something that Abigail really suffered with so she really needed a minimum of a two-hour break. Now in those um, papers you can open an exam half an hour early or half an hour late without any prior permission required so schools can just do that. Um, the second thing is that that um, time scale can be moved up to an hour um, but that would need to be applied for. Now, the other thing I will say is that most of the things that I'm talking about were in situ five years ago and many things have changed. So please don't hold me to anything. It may have changed. But that was the situation when we were there. We unfortunately weren't allowed to do that, um, which did present a problem. However, the thing that school did offer us, amazingly, was that we could switch our exams around. So where Abigail had a science exam and obviously wanted to do engineering, um, where she had a very short break um, between the afternoon exam, she was able to switch the morning and afternoon exam around. So we did, for instance, biology in the morning, which is the one she wanted to do better in, and then the French exam in the afternoon. Now, it did mean that in the period between those two exams, she had to remain supervised, but for Abigail, that wasn't an issue. Um, the other issue I would say is, unfortunately, 
if you do end up in this situation, what Abigail was decided was in order to um, have a break between some of her exams, she did decide on a finite time she would finish her exam. So she wouldn't necessarily use all her extra time in order to have a slightly longer break before her afternoon exam. Now, obviously that's not ideal, but that's something that we decided was probably beneficial to her individually. Um, so, um, Alison, yeah. can you wrap up in like three minutes? Is that okay? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, just very quickly to mention that there's two access types, those that need approval and those that don't. So be aware of that. Um, in the way we got around a lot of problems was by writing things into her EHCP. So knowing that section B and section F are the legally binding ones, think about all the things that you require for your child, okay? And think about almost having like a checklist and writing those into your EHCP. Um, so I think that despite what you're told, it is, you can write almost everything into your EHCP if you use some creative thought and some careful wording. So in particular, exam access arrangements were a real sticking point for us. So what we came up with was we wrote an appendix, which was her access arrangement. And then we wrote several clauses in section F. So for instance, we had things like talk through with Abigail and her parents, available strategies to be equipped for the exam, including her use of access arrangements in advance of any deadline for submission. The detail will be determined after that discussion about legal as well as practical issues. And then we had things like, the school will maintain compliance with JCQ guidelines and supporting Abigail, see access arrangements, appendix one. The school will consult with Abigail um, and then they will, um, they will um, apply to JCQ for those access arrangements. So that's the kind of thing that we were able to put in. Thinking about um, invigilators not being prepared. Again, we wrote in a sentence that said they will have had training and that Abigail will have tried, um, had two trial exams with her actual invigilator before the day. Um, we prepared written documents um, of what the reader and what Abigail um, was and wasn't allowed to do in the exams with actual um, examples. So saying that she could point to a point on a graph and ask them if it was plotted at 5-2. Um, so things like that. Um, what else was I going to say? Special consideration, I just want to mention that. Um, Abigail had 11 exams that so had major problems in. Um, afterwards, we um, applied to school and said, please, can you make sure that you can apply for these special considerations? And school said, we're not going to tell you what we're going to um, ask for special consideration for, and we're not obliged to tell you. And again, looking through that documentation carefully, the JCQ guidance, we actually found a clause that said that, I can't remember exactly what it said, but we did have a right to know what they were going to apply for, and we could have input into that. So. I think it's about knowing your facts, about not being put off if you're told a certain thing. We were told that certain things were JCQ regulations and they weren't. So again, if you can then sort of highlight the part of the JCQ and throw it back to them and say, actually, JCQ said this. So one of them was about, Abigail mentioned, not being allowed rest breaks in the extra time. That's very clear in the guidance that there's no maximum limit and that you can take rest breaks at any point at all during the exam. So again, that's how we were kind of able to get around that. Um, I Sorry, I just, we've only got half an hour left and we've sure. got Alice and the other, but I just want to say it's such good information. You've got so much more to say. We did have a conversation, um, Abby and Alison and I, um, a week of, in preparation. So there's, there's other knowledge and we're going to put together some documents and Alison, I think later in the year we're going to do something about educational healthcare plans. 
in um, liaising with more vision and some and guide dogs. And so actually we might be coining on you again because other parents experience, people who've been there and done that. And um, yeah, support of their children is so important. But Abby, can you also tell everyone what you're doing now? Because I think that's so brilliant. And despite everything, you're doing what you want to, which is amazing. Yes. Um, so yeah, as you heard, exams didn't go great. I didn't get the results I wanted, but I got to university, um, got to study product design engineering, which is exactly what I wanted to study. And I'm now undertaking my year in industry as part of my course with Airbus, um, working in the space industry on like all the cool stuff, like satellites and rockets and stuff that I like had always dreamed of as a kid. So it all worked out. <laughs> Yeah, and Abby is a real example of a brilliant look mentor who goes and supports mentees with their kind of experiences and hands out kind of tips. And so, yeah, that's why Look has such a huge, very active mental service. It's what we're um, kind of known for, but obviously kind of parent support is crucial as well. So thank you both very, very much. So Alice, it's your turn um, to talk to us now. Alice is a Braillist. Again, kind of been very determined in her experience in education. Probably just waited finding her unmute because it's hard to find. Alice, are you ready? There you are. I'm here. Okay. Hi, hi, everyone. Brilliant. Uh, Thank you yeah. for your patience. So do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll talk through kind of yeah. the questions? I know you thought about them. Yeah, of course. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Alice. I'm 24 and I'm a look mentor. Um, I lost my vision very suddenly at the age of 15 and I've got optic atrophy. Um, I'm a Braille user and also during my exams, I had rest breaks, um, a reader slash scribe and um, yeah, I think that's it mostly, yeah. So what are the key things you'd like to tell us um, about your experience of exam provision? Um, well, for me, I think I definitely had mis um, like mixed experiences. Um, so I had some good and some bad, but I like to kind of, mostly reflect on the positives um I always think it's kind of good to have a positive outlook on things but um because I did a level maths and a level psychology I did like fewer a levels than everyone else and also I only did a few GCSEs um because that kind of worked for me personally rather than being overloaded with so much and also because I lost my sight later on in life I've you know, I'm now 24 at uni, um, so I just kind of want to show that you can still do exams, um, like, fewer and, you know, at an older age and still actually succeed and be able to do what you want to do. Um, but the things I think I want to share, really, is that, um, so during my A-level maths exams, um, I found that quite tricky. I mean, in the first place, my college wasn't very supportive of me wanting to do A-level maths because it's such a visual subject and all the tactile diagrams, they didn't like provide me with all the accessible resources. So I did struggle quite a lot during A-level maths, but I still never gave up and um, I carried on um, and did the exams and got a grade C um, despite everything and um, I don't think I would have been able to get through that though without the amazing support from my mum who was always there to help me like with my homework and accessing materials um, and luckily for us we could afford a private maths tutor as well so that really helped with um, my learning and understanding and also I had um, some amazing support from a brilliant QTVI who was absolutely crucial in like my learning and understanding because as much as the content is so important to learn, I found that just like having the um, right accessible materials and being able to learn like the crucial skills like braille and tactile skills 
and kind of learning how to orientate around diagrams was just as uh, as important as learning the course content so yeah they were all really crucial things in my learning um and in my a-level maths exam there was some things that did go wrong like sometimes um the braille was formatted incorrectly so I couldn't understand what it was saying especially for like mathematical expressions um also some tactile diagrams were printed wrong as well but my QTBI kind of helped support me to kind of come up with some strategies to help me cope with exams so if things did go wrong like I would still be able to focus and carry on and not let that kind of affect my overall grade um so that really helped me and also just a lot of regular communication with my lecturers and the college really helped me as well so um especially with my psychology tutors like they'd never come across a visually impaired student before but um because I told them my needs one of them was even so amazing to record all the powerpoints so um I had them in audio format as well as like a written format so that was really helpful um and through regular communication they helped me to kind of be able to kind of understand and grasp things in different formats rather than just braille or um other things um I'm trying to think what else I can say that um are really key and important but I think um at the time I did kind of compare myself to my peers thinking oh I'm much older than everyone or I'm doing fewer A levels and GCSEs but looking back now um I wish I hadn't have done that because um yeah I still you know was able to achieve what I wanted and I'm now studying psychology at university despite um all the challenges I had at college so it is possible um so there and there is some positives um and also as well with revision I think one really good tip for revision um for your VI child is that um it can be really hard to find accessible materials to try and like prepare in as much time as possible but also what really helped me is rather just doing it in one format such as braille um or listening to my screen reader I used to watch a lot of YouTube videos which would really help found some really good like accessible websites like Simply Psychology um and also tackling past papers was really important um I found that kind of the best method to practice and be prepared for the exams Thank you. I know that you, when we've talked in the past, um, you said it was hard because there were mistakes, but in the end, you kind of, you prepared for it. So it was okay. A bit like Simon was saying, it's kind of, yeah. you, you almost, that's fine. You learn how to deal with it. You've got it. You've got options. And yeah, but I think that was an amazing skill that you learned. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't have been able to do like without the support of my QTVI. Like she helped me like prepare for all those things that could go wrong. Um, and even after like preparing for lots of diagrams in psychology, my A level psychology exam had no diagrams, so I felt like that was a massive bonus as well. Um, but but yeah, um, I mean it has been tough like sometimes, but um, I feel like I've got through it, and I just had to like advocate for myself. And with the support of my mum, I've been able to get through it as well. So she's always been fighting my corner and um, helping me access all the materials. So, yeah. <laughs> Did, have you shared what you got for your A-level psychology? I got a grade A. <laughs> um, so I was really pleased with that because that's what I was aiming for. Um, and psychology and maths are my, like, my favourite subjects. So um yeah <laughs> despite everything and all the challenges you know it is possible to get good grades and um yeah I just want to be like living proof of that so um it, even though it can be quite hard at the time to feel like you're only um doing fewer like A-levels or GCSEs uh, you can still get far
Thank you. Brilliant, Alice. And actually, we had a discussion last year, um, talk about kind of mental health and stress around exams. So there is a top tip sheet that we can share as part of this afterwards, all about kind of helping your child through exam stress. So Alice had lots of views then to share about that as well. Thank you so much. Again, it's great to hear that, you know, kind of it wasn't a mixed bag of experience it, but you've been determined and you've got through it and you're where you want to be studying psychology um, at um, degree level. So that's amazing, Alice. Well done. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Fabulous. So um, we have got a lot to get through this evening, but I'm really glad to um, welcome two um, of Pearson researchers, um, Lian, Lian and um yeah. Kevin, sorry, I was just reading your name again. It's been a long night to share with us the research you're doing at the moment. Um, two Look families have, I know, have helped you initially with kind of modified paper research, and um, there's more to do, isn't there? So, um, have you got enough? To, could you can you cut it down a little bit so I can fit fifteen minutes? Is that possible? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think we only need fifteen minutes. So, Kevin, let's make it. Are we doing Thank you. Minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thank you so Thank much you. for having us. So just yep. let me share my um, screen. Um, so um, good good evening, everyone. So my name is Li Yuan. I'm a senior assessment researcher from uh, Pearson Research Team. So in the next 15 minutes, um, my colleague Kevin and, and I are going to um, introduce our modified exam paper research project. And I also um, want to explore some opportunities in, uh, to involve more um, look UK families in our studies in the near future. So um, as you can see uh, from this slide, we just put four items in our today's uh, agenda. So I will start by um, talking about uh, the objectives and achievement of our research project. Then I will uh, try to uh, talk about the modified exam paper research findings in brief. And then I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Kevin Mason, to talk about the uh, case studies and uh, the research involvement in the future. So um, on your right right hand side, you can see that that is a display of um, um, peers and accessibility research work. Um, so, um, so we uh, started to, we initiated um, this project since 2022 because Pearson noticed that there is a, there was a, a significant increase in demand for uh, modified papers at GCSE level um, since the pandemic. So for our research project as a timely response, we um, really focus on answering two research questions. Uh, the first one is how are modified papers accessed and used at UK schools and how are our students engaging with um, modified, modified pa uh, modifications and assistive technologies. And, the, um, and the, uh, within the heart of the research, we want to encourage our students to advocate for their needs and also put the, their voices um, at the heart of, of our work. So um, oh, when we've done this research, we always think about to make some, to drive some changes. So regarding the changes we have made so far, it's mainly around two dimensions. The first one is the service improvement. So in 2022, um, the Pearson launched the, the bad size exam officer training modules for both UK centers and international centers. This is because we noticed there were a lot of new exam officers um, after the pandemic and to ensure they have the enough the, the best knowledge to support our students so that it results in the um, uh, best size exam officer training modules. And also we noticed that um, our stakeholders, including parents, QTVIs, and even students, they try to search some information from uh, Pearson Modified Format's uh, official web page. So um, uh, our Modified Format team always uh, make sure they have updated um, web page uh, with the essential knowledge um, about modification. And uh, on the other dimension, <clears throat> The changes we really drive is about the modified exam paper <clears throat> publications and the campaign. Um, so in 2022, we published the initial findings uh, from a pilot study 
And then by the end of last year, we published two case studies. So for these two case studies, we adopted a storytelling approach and really focusing on the holistic assessment taking experience of two uh, very impaired students. So my colleague Kevin is going to give you a little bit um, more details in later slides. And uh, we also try to um, share our research findings um, and also the case studies um, with our peers in uh, school contacts. So by the end of um, last Christmas, we shared our work with over 17,000 school contacts through email across all subjects. But as, and also at the same time, we tried to use multiple social media platform, including LinkedIn, uh, peer Edexcel Twitter and the Pearson qualify, qualification webpage to create a modified paper campaign. And we also communicate our research findings at the international conference conferences with um, uh, other exam boards like, like AQA, OCR, and uh, also the of core regulators. And we also presented our work at the R9 exam update session in 2023 last year. So um, that really brings us to the, the, the findings. So in this slide, I'm going, only going to um, present four findings in brief. Um, so the findings are coming from a very diverse um, data source. So um, as mentioned before, our research work is a multi-year research program. So we started our work um, in early 2022 and uh, 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 by sending uh, the exam officer and the student survey to over 1,000 UK centers in 2022. And as a result, we received 134 um, ex uh, responses for the exam officer survey. Um, but for the student survey, we only received 30 responses by the end of last year. So this is also one of the main difficulty uh, for conducting um, the accessibility research is uh, we, are, we found it, uh, it's extremely hard to get students involved in such kind of study. And then uh, in 2022, we finished our pilot study um, with vision impaired students as a focus. So we visited one, uh, so we, we get it done uh, with the support of one mainstream school in England. And then uh, in 2023, uh, 2023, early 2023, we also finished our phase one interviews with blind and vision impaired students um, by visiting two mainstream schools. And uh, from the um, end of last year, we started collaborating with uh, Look UK families and collect, collect more data uh, with the support of um, our, uh, our, our, uh, our students and uh, their parents. Um, but at the same time, we are not only focusing on the um, vision impaired and blind children, we also focus on uh, the interactive PDF users. So those are the students with dyslexia, autism, color, color blindness, or students uh, who are struggling with hand uh, uh, handwriting. So last year, we also spoke with um, four UK schools and uh, um, the main data collection uh, will happen, also happen um, in this February and March. So the one of the main output of uh, this study um, is a collection of the case, of, of the case studies uh, with the theme of encouraging our students to advocate their um, access, access arrangement needs effectively. So, so far we have got two case studies published and the three in preparation. So um, for our, uh, for this um, research work um, here, I only pre presented the four main findings. So the first one is really echo what uh, our IB presented is adopt students uh, normal way of working. So we found a lot of students um, daily practice with life exam level assessment is crucial. So the practicing past exam papers can reduce a student's uncertainty and enhance their performance in high stake exams. And the second one is about the sensory input such as 3D shapes and screen readers enables multi-sensory learning and supports students' diverse learning needs. So I, I really want to give you a little bit more details about 3D shapes. So as Alice mentioned, um, for math is a is a highly visual uh, subject. So uh, when we interviewed um, very impaired and blind students, we found when using the 3D shapes, uh, the first thing they found the 3D shapes is really user friendly. 
So it is intuitive even for the first time user. And also when they are using 3D shapes, they can focus on the essentials. And for vision impaired students, they can observe the, the shapes uh, from different dimensions uh, without causing uh, uh, eye strain. And for the uh, uh, Braille users, they can get, um, get some touch on experience. Uh, they still enjoy uh, doing mathematics uh, with 3D shapes. But however, uh, we found that for this type, for this type of um, assistive technology, some schools are un unaware of uh, the this available resources. So here we just uh, uh, bring. Uh, so I just want to bring you to the third uh, funding. So some schools are unaware of uh, the available resources, such as color diagrams. So some uh, in our st student interviews, some students said they really prefer the color diagrams. Um, for doing subject like geography, but uh, they do not know uh, if this um, if color diagrams uh, can be provided by exam boards or not. So I just want to mention Pearson offer uh, the colored diagrams as well as the um, black and white uh, diagrams um, and also 3D shapes and interactive PDFs um, for our students. And the schools are also lack of knowledge about how to utilize um, these different um, assistive technologies effectively. And our last funding is really a reflect on the changes we drive uh, from this study. So the surrounding uh, services need to remain up to, to date. Uh, so that includes um, the training for exam officers and updating the web page uh, with essential information about modifications. So um, now I'm going to hand it over to Kevin to talk about our case studies. Kevin? Hi. Um, hello. So in particular, something we've talked about a lot is uh, kind of uh, humanizing some of the stories, some of the things we found and bring them into case studies. And uh, so far, we've published two. They're both with students who used modified large print papers. Uh, Catherine, I think, uh, from memory, she was using uh, 24.84, uh, whereas Arthur was using 36.83 uh, papers. And they echo some of the messages we, we've talked about. So like uh, Catherine talks a lot about how, about the importance of being your own advocate, about, um, about speaking to uh, people at your school and making sure you um, kind of explain your needs and you can, and those needs are as far as possible uh, met and understood. Uh, and certainly uh, well, when we interviewed her, we interviewed her with um, teachers at the school and uh, she admitted herself that uh, there were times where she hadn't done a great job of that and she wished she'd um, kind of put her hand up a little bit more and uh, it just uh, very small things like she used a laptop to type up some answers uh, and during the summer exams uh, where she was fine doing her mocks in February, uh, in the summer it was a lot sunnier, uh, the sun had moved around a little bit and, and she was getting a bit of glare off her screen and uh, she said that she, uh, when it came to it, she didn't kind of put her hand up and ask to be uh, moved necessarily. Uh, and that caused a little bit of eye strain in, in her exams. And so um, she uh, she just, she emphasised exactly like Alice was saying earlier on about uh, the importance of self-advocacy when you're talking to uh, to your school and, and going through that. Um, in terms of Arthur's story, Arthur, um, he was a brailleist until he was, uh, at the beginning of year seven, so through primary school, um, uh, up until uh, not long after he started his secondary school, he, he was a brailleist. Uh, and he talked about how it was really important to understand that um, as you grow, uh, lots of things change, uh, including some of your needs and the, the best uh, kind of response to those needs. And uh, he talked about some of those challenges, about how uh, he uh, still found it, challenging to to write by hand because he he hadn't had those years of practice when he was in primary school uh but instead he in, he was using he was really good at using it uh and uh, really uh kind of applied technical solutions to to look at his uh to look at the way he kind of worked and he, he accessed exams uh much like Catherine as well he talked about the importance of uh kind of that 
that feeling of being prepared when you walk into the exam room of knowing exactly what's going to happen. I think Abby mentioned earlier on about how or uh, how she would um, kind of practice with her invigilators uh, to exams before she she got in there. And uh, Arthur talked about the the shock of walking to his first exam and seeing that day's date on on the exam paper and how that kind of surprised him a little bit and and how everything just felt a little bit more real when he did that. It, he said it didn't bother him, but all of a sudden he was looking at the exam paper with that day's date for the first time and uh, it brought home exactly what he was doing. So those kind of little pieces, messages we've heard before, but trying to kind of pull them out through those stories. Um, we are working on some more at the moment with uh, Look UK Families and uh, we're kind of uh, uh, looking forward to bringing those out over the next few months, I think, aren't we, Leo? And I think we may have the next slide. Um, so with that, uh, we're always keen. It's really, really difficult for us to speak to students. We, uh, are, we're an exam board. We know the names of people who request modified papers and not much else. Um, we email those people. They're very, very, very busy in schools. Um, and they're obviously for rightfully really protective of of their students. Um, and they're protective of their students where people get in touch with them and say, we would like to pull them out of lessons for uh, an hour and sit and talk to them and ask them a, a lot of questions. Um, and that's perfectly understandable. But uh, without that student voice, we can't learn from them we, there's nothing really we can do and that's really difficult so um if you're interested in participating in student or parent interviews uh parents are even harder to speak to than students uh because we're, we're that further much further removed uh we've got an email there please get in touch um we'd be absolutely delighted to hear from you uh and we'll set something up kind of as soon as we can even if it's just a 10 minute chat to explain uh, what we're looking for and what we're planning to do and what we were planning to do with it. And that'd be uh, really informal, hopefully relaxed, and that'd be really, really useful. I think that may be the last slide. It's always good when you see your own logo. Uh, but obviously we've got some. We haven't we haven't got here alone. Uh, so uh, that's really, those the names on there have been really, really important and really helpful to us. Um, like, uh, Ben, Grace, uh, and Haley in our in our team, uh, Louise and Rachel do amazing work with modified formats, um, and one of the reasons why I see comments in the thing about uh, from Heike about um, being really grateful to Pearson for changing the the map. That's down to their work. They've been brilliant. Uh, Joe, Joe and Leslie getting our uh, work out there and, and Shan as well have been really really useful in getting in touch with people uh, publicizing our work and, and that's really what we're doing thank you so much there's um, some chat Can, what about families that have recently so someone like Abby's now at university so she's not yet would she you know I'm sure she and Alison would like you know there's other families beyond that year 13 now would they be valid or or do, are you sticking to that criteria? I think one of the challenges for us is once they leave school, they mm. fall off our map. Um, we so we have got the groups. There's there's people that so we're really if you're happy to, you know, we will share your um, information as part of um, you know the resources. So you happy for anybody interested to get in touch? To share, or you know what give us some guidelines because you know there's some families from Wales there's families like you know Abby and Alison who are a bit older than that 10 to 13 but we we're a group of parents who come together to support each other to help our children through these difficult experiences they can have to offer hip, to hip, hints I can't speak anymore and advice and so I'm sure there would be families from outside that range if you're interested all right go on there yeah sure so uh, i think we may focus on year 10 to um 13 students um and uh, also we really 
So the, the 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 quality of the interviews are really really important. So when we interview parents and students, we will try to see if there are some some new um themes emerging from the interviews. So currently, I think we already interviewed um six real students, including two from the uh look UK families. But we, we are still looking for another three to four um students and parents. So if they they would like to share their stories. We are here to listen. Okay, thank you. And it's just really, really heartening. I want to thank everybody. I've got a minute. John, you said that you might round it up. But from my point of view, before you do, I just want to thank everyone for taking part. It is a really stressful time for us and our children. My daughter's um, just done her mocks. Um, and, you know, we just want to have those mar barriers removed we we know it's a sighted world but between us between the view qtvis um the exam boards that want to make a difference it's really it is heartening and um i thank everyone for sharing alice and abby and alison in particular for kind of being happy to come and tell us about your experiences but also that it hasn't destroyed you which is also very reassuring so um yeah, um, so remember to do your um, surveys when they pop up, if you can. And John, over to you for the last 30 seconds. Properly 30 seconds. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everybody. Uh, really on behalf of you and the voluntary sector, so colleagues, Jane and Simon, I think I did say three takeaways and I think everybody's covered it. Start early with your communication with settings and the CFVI that I've put in the chat is a really good tool. The 11 sections, you can sit with Senkos and say, what are we doing about all of these? One of the sections is preparation for adulthood and that ties in with exams and assessment. Make sure you get to know the exams officer in your setting they are a fount of knowledge and really always supportive but sometimes can feel a bit sidelined and suddenly get asked to do things but understanding why they're doing it can be also be really helpful and the third one and i think it's it's been shown really clearly there the presentation from colleagues from Pearson is exam boards really want children and young people to be successful and they can only do that by getting that level of feedback and seeing um, Heinke's contribution in the chat there really showed that they're, they're open to change, they're open to ideas um, whilst ensuring that exams are fair and fair for everybody and that's the important thing. So thank you to Look for letting us get involved. Back to you Jen. Thank you. No, it's really important. We love to collaborate and um, show our families as much support as possible. Thank you all for coming. We have a chat session once a month. Our next is on February the 12th, where we can just come and chew the fat ourselves between us. And then our next um, kind of panel event is on understanding cortical visual impairment um, through education and home. Um, so that should be interesting too. Thank you all. Uh, we will, what we'll do with the chat is we'll lift it all up. There's been so many conversations happening. We will create resources in partnership with you and RNIB as well. And just a big thank you um, for you all for coming along. And yeah, brilliant. Have good evenings. I'm ready to have, yeah, uh, a bit of a rest now myself. A nice cup of tea, I think. So have a good evening. And if the panel members are happy to stay on just so I can thank you again at the end, that would be brilliant. Bye everyone. Thank you so much for coming.